Hello, you are listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, our guest today is Bob Gardner. Bob Gardner is the founder of The Freedom Specialist and the author of Built for Freedom and host of the podcast, Alive and Free. You can find out more about Bob Gardner and his wonderful work at his website, thefreedomspecialist.com. Welcome, Bob Gardner. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I just love that you're talking about freedom because in my work as a medical intuitive healer, I find all kinds of people who feel trapped. They feel trapped in their job. They feel trapped in their body. They may feel trapped in an addictive process, or they may feel trapped in a terrible marriage, or they may feel trapped in an illness and not be able to get out of it. Why do you call yourself the freedom specialist? It was a practical choice, really. Um, I had to call my company something. And I had started out working people with people primarily trapped in addiction, trapped in these compulsive behaviors. And I could have called myself an addiction specialist. I could have called myself, but I was like, every addict is a specialist in addiction. <laughs> I could have. I could have called myself any number of things, but I thought, where do I want my focus, my mental focus to be? If as I think about my business, the word addiction comes up or depression comes up, then like then that's on the top of my mind. And everything I cared about was not just like freedom from these like struggles, but like true freedom in the sense that like what is possible for human beings can actually be manifest. And so I called it the freedom specialist, mostly as a goad to myself to keep my eye on the target. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, what does freedom mean to you? Uh, freedom for me, it well, it grew. It actually grew in stages because at first it was not doing the things that were painful. And then, and then not having to be bothered by them or thinking about them or urged to do it. And then eventually it became like this state of being mm -hmm. where there's this effervescence on the inside that is easily uh, detectable and acknowledgeable and enjoyable. And in that state, all of the old stuff just never shows up. So freedom from something to me means it never arises in my consciousness anymore unless somebody else brings it up. But freedom as a daily practice is this awareness of what's going on inside my system and this enjoyment of what it's like to be alive. Beautiful explanation. Now, in my work as a medical intuitive healer, when I'm doing healing work on people who feel trapped, one of the things that I point out is when we feel trapped, we feel like we don't have choices, like I'm stuck in this job or I'm stuck in this marriage. Or I'm stuck in this body, but we always have a choice. And part of it is just realizing what those choices are, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So in your point of view, there's nothing actually wrong with people, right? Correct. So tell me more about your point of view. What if there's nothing actually wrong with you? So this was, I mean, I spent 18 years struggling with addiction and depression. I mean, I walked to the streets at night hoping for a bus to hit me because I didn't want to end my own life and put my family through that kind of pain. And so I was just hoping that someone else would do it or God would do it or any number of other things. So I certainly lived believing that there was something wrong with me, that I didn't fit in. It started from a young age with my family moving around in the military and always having to make new friends and being the odd man out and all of those other things. So I, I can definitely feel for the people that believe that there's something wrong with them. But the more I dove into that way of thinking that, oh, well, there's a chemical imbalance or I have inherited some genetic thing and that's making my life miserable or it's because I had this traumatic event happen, the more it sort of perpetuated itself. So I just stepped back and I asked myself the question, what if I've got this backwards? 
what if everything everybody's telling me about addiction or depression or anxiety or any of these other things is just the best that they know, but given that they're not actually curing it, maybe it's not the best way to look at the situation. So I stepped back and, and there was a moment of realization where I recognized that I wasn't born feeling that way, which means I learned it, which means it's a skill set. It's a habit, not a character flaw, not something that's wrong with me, just something I happen to be doing. And I thought, well, shoot, if I can learn to be that good at misery on autopilot, <laughs> that I can what if I could learn to be that good at happiness and joy on autopilot? What if it's like a habit or a muscle memory or an instinct? And I eventually found and settled on that it was, let's call that an instinct. And then I started looking for how do I train this instinct? How did I train it the first time? How can I turn that around? And so as I did that, this happiness started to well up inside me. Nothing about who I am changed, but everything about my life experience changed. So it became really blatantly obvious that there was never anything wrong with me. I was just experiencing circumstances that I didn't like and didn't realize I could actually change them. Beautiful observation. Now, in my work as a medical intuitive healer, I talk about the five levels of healing, the physical level, your body, the energy level, which is the acupuncture system, the chakras and the breath, the emotional body which is the largest part of everyone the mental body which is your thoughts and beliefs and the soul level so when i think there's something wrong with me that's a thought that's a belief and personally i feel like everyone needs a healing on i'm already good enough the way that i am <laughs> right absolutely <laughs> and, and everyone needs a healing on i deserve to be happy i deserve to be healthy Whenever I'm training other healers, one of the things that I talk about is that it's so critical for me as a healer when I'm working with people to see each person as whole and not broken. And the truth is there is no such thing as a vacuum in the universe. Vacuums actually don't exist. And at any moment, any point in time, you already have everything that you need, even if it's a phone number to someone who can help you, right? Sure. So you're already whole and complete. And that is so important that we see ourselves that way. And it's so critical that when we find practitioners to work with, that we find practitioners who see our own wholeness and who can help us see and experience our wholeness. And my second book, What is Healing? I talked about what is healing. And I think one of the definitions of healing is actually experiencing wholeness. Yeah, well, the word heal comes from the word whole. Like they're etymologically, they come from the same place. Um, you know, what I tend to have to do with people is help them understand that the idea of brokenness itself is, is not a real thing. Like if I break a stick in half, I can look at it and say, I broke this. But in the natural world, like existence just has two bits of stick. That's all there is. <laughs> it's existing in two places at once now. You know? So, so um, the notion of brokenness is it, in order to feel broken, a human has to look at something, then make an assessment about the way that it should be, decide that it's not that way and that it has somehow deviated from that declare it broken and then experience all the disappointment and pain that comes from it. And that's a lot of energy and a lot of steps instead of just going like, well, wait, hold on, let's, let's just go back and look at what's there and enjoy that and start to nourish what could be possible. Yes. So if I think I'm broken, that's a thought and belief. And we have to realize that our thoughts and beliefs create our emotions. So if I think I'm broken, that's going to, be a primary cause of depression and anxiety versus if I see myself as whole and begin as you talk about to discover my inner resources, then I have a different experience. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that you suffered from addictions. What kind of addictions did you personally suffer from? I spent a good long time chasing internet pornography and sexual exploits as a way to kind of manage things. And then 
I uh, I spent a number of years uh, chasing down drug experiences to try and escape. I was looking for spiritual enlightenment. I was chasing down this, if I just get salvation, <laughs> then it'll solve everything else. And when it became clear that that was not producing anything but more experiences, that also became a problem. Uh, what started to happen was the quote unquote addictions, um, which is a word that I challenge heavily, both in my book and in everything that I do with people. But um, they started out in a very taboo place. I grew up having been raised very religious, having had a sort of moral idea in, um, taught to me and adopted by me because uh, that was my view of the world. So pornography was like this taboo thing way out there. And then the drugs as well, very, very taboo. And so as I was starting to try and figure things out, the way that the best I could manage was like control those. And then the compulsion became around sugar and chasing down adrenaline experiences and things that everybody else is like, oh, it's fine. It's not a big deal. But it didn't change the basic discomfort that I had in my body. And so those were those were some of the main things that I started to to chase down. And and they kind of shrunk over time until I finally got fed up with the whole question of addiction. And I decided to go someplace else. So what I love about your explanation, Bob Gardner, is you as you point out that as human beings, we can have multiple addictions. And as you said, some of them can seem OK, like addiction to sugar. Right. Yeah. So and but it's all part of the same process. So you said you don't like the word addiction. How would right. you how would you describe the process of addiction and how would you describe healing from addiction? So early on, see everything, one of the reasons I don't like the word addiction is because there's so much baggage and urban legend and kind of false belief and misinformation about it that as soon as we enter it into the conversation, everybody's going to bring all that with it. And then that's a lot to deal with. So when people are coming to me to talk about the, the things that they're struggling with, the first thing I do is back them up and I go, okay, cool. But what's actually happening? What, what did you do? What happened before then? What happened after then? And it becomes very, very clear to everybody. Oh, wow. I just had an experience. And if I added the label addiction or relapse to it, now I've made it into a bigger experience and a bigger thing to overcome that has as a byproduct you're never going to get over it. You're going to be a recovering addict for life and all the other stuff. So the first issue I had with the word addiction was that. The next one was when I started looking at it. And I realized historically, it's a new, it's, well, the earliest addicts on the planet were actually people who had devoted their lives to God. <laughs> they were the priests and oracles at Delphi. They were like these religious adepts. And they, because to addict means to say yes to something. Mm -hmm. and that's all it means. And so, yes, it's somebody who has said, yes, I will give my power and authority over to this thing. And that was first religion. And then in the in the eight, 18th century or so, one of the founding fathers kind of gave this theory that, whoa, what if this is kind of a disease thing? And that hung in the background for a while until 1879 and a brilliant marketer, Leslie Keeley, a little bit of a quack doctor, shows up and says, alcoholism is a disease and I can cure you. Great. Now we have a marketing slogan and that picks up like wildfire and everybody else is like, oh, sweet. It's not a moral problem. It's not something wrong with me. I just happen to have a disease. That's all the issue. So now everybody latches onto that. 50 years later, a number of uh, uh, med medical doctors and scientists are trying to figure out if this is real. They can't find it anywhere. But by then, the idea has taken so much hold. And then shortly thereafter, the 12-step programs pick up. So then everybody is starting to talk about this disease model of addiction. But in no laboratory anywhere on the planet has any molecule of addiction ever been found. People have tried to blame this, that, or the other. But it's never been substantiated, never been corroborated. In fact, there's a mountain of evidence to the contrary that the more likely a person believes in addiction, I mean, the more, more a person believes in addiction, the more likely they are to actually experience and display behaviors that we would call addict behaviors. So for me to help a person, the first thing I've got to do is challenge the notion, what if you're not an addict? Now, for me, it was helpful to say I was an addict at first. So I don't want to take that away from anybody because it gave me a way to label or diagnose like on the Disneyland map, oh, you are here. Mm -hmm. But when you figure out where you are on the map, staying there isn't useful either. So what I did from there was go, okay, cool. That's where I was. Where's the exit? <laughs> okay. 
Now let's move. And so I don't want to take that away from anybody who is who feels that calling themselves an addict is helpful, but just to recognize that that may identify where you are. But if you don't want to stay there forever, you cannot identify with that moving forward. So yeah. we're just looking. What's so going it's, on? On, it's a shift on the mental level. We have to see ourselves as, as something different, right? Yep. And with that, let's take a break and listen to one of our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. I'm Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer. And we're listening to the founder of the Freedom Specialist. Bob Gardner, in my 30 years experience in natural healing, one of the things that I observe as a medical intuitive healer is that dis-ease begins in the field. So what do I mean by that? So dis dis-ease doesn't actually begin in the physical body. Dis-ease, illness, all illnesses begin either on the soul level on the mental level, which we've been talking about how it's so critical to not see yourself as broken, to see yourself as whole and having access to all the resources that you need on the emotional level, because emotions can shut down anything or on the energetic level. So that disease actually comes into the physical level. And when we want to heal, you've got to move it out. You've got to move it out of the physical, out of the energetic system, out of the emotions. You've got to resolve the emotions that cause the illness. You've got to change your thoughts and beliefs. And you need to learn the spiritual lessons. In your work, you believe that trauma begins and ends in the body. How do you deal with trauma and how can we remove it according to your system at the Freedom Specialist? Yeah, I mean, I think if we're talking about fields, you and I are sort of talking about similar things, right? Um, but the electrical fields of the body are, are generated from the inside. So we can short circuit them from the inside of the system. You've got major nerve centers in obviously the brain, in the heart, in the gut, and then of course in the meridian system, like all over the body. Mm -hmm. In these little microtubules in the fascia and stuff, there's, there's all sorts of things happening and they create a variety of different kinds of fields. Now, inside of that, um, if there's a disturbance outside, like somebody walks by when they smell like, I don't know, something nasty, that's going to disturb the field. And that field then radiates into the body. The biggest field is your heart. And that one's like 10, 20 feet outside the body. It ends up being then the first responder to everything happening in the outside world. So the light that comes from the sun goes through the field of the heart before it ever hits your eyeballs which means that your heart first has a chance to respond to sunlight and to the eye roll from your favorite spouse and, and to the little thing that the kids are screaming and to everything else that's happening on television. It's your heart first that does its little kadunk kadunk. And then that sits on your diaphragm. And so as the heart's tensing up the cardiovascular system, the diaphragm is then now starting to adjust the breath to kind of manage and maintain that. And then all that information goes up to the head and the brain goes, what is happening right now? Because it's not in touch with the outside world. So then it decides, based on its own recognition, its own thought processes, its own beliefs that have been formed over time, oh, this is what's happening. I know what's happening. And then the, it sends a message down to the whole rest of the body to mobilize itself, to respond to that the best way that it knows how based on past experience. Trauma itself, then, is that decision about what something means that happens at a time of intensity. There's an event that happens. The body does just hands, like if the wind blows on my fingers and they move this way and that, the mind doesn't really care. But if it's intense enough, the mind doesn't necessarily want to have the body experience that again. So it creates a story around it. These would be our beliefs about stuff. And that story is then the first thing that's grabbed when the body hits that same thing again, because every cell in the body has a level of memory to it. So as soon as it hits it that second time, the first thing that happens is it recognizes it from the past, then the body has an instinctive reaction to it. That instinctive reaction is what we're calling trauma. It's like a muscle memory of response 
to outside situations. So in order to change that, the first thing we have to do is open up the perception and change the things that give the body the idea that it's in trouble in the first place. These are breathing, posture, muscle tensions, the way that you're moving, possibly nutrition and, and water, obviously, if you're dehydrated and stuff. But the, in a moment, those are probably not the things like you're not going to be like, mm, I think I need a banana right now and I'll be OK. <laughs> so I work with what are the things that your every human being on the planet has at their disposal all the time to reverse engineer the problem so that when they experience what is called a trigger, the first time they react to it in a bad way. But this, this next time, if they just change the way they breathe, change the way they move, and all of a sudden they feel really good in this situation, their brain suddenly goes, oh, maybe it's not as bad as I thought it was. And the trauma starts to go away, sometimes instantly, like it never comes back because the brain, the body doesn't want to have negative reactions. It wants to just handle everything like it's a summer breeze. Okay, interesting explanation. Your explanation sounds very much like the word of, uh, work of Moshe Feldenkrais. So Moshe Feldenkrais was the founder of a system of movement called Feldenkrais. And in his work, um, every mood that you have has an associated posture and breathing pattern and thought pattern, right? So let's say I'm always depressed and I'm always hunched over and my lungs are collapsed. And that's a, 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 a habit at the cellular level. So by changing the way I, my posture and changing my breathing pattern, I can begin to unwind that process. So it, it sounds very much, your work sounds very much like the work of Moshe Feldenkrais. Absolutely. His is a lot really, really gentle, really subtle, very kind of slow moving. I, I trained in a little bit of, of Feldenkrais along with the other things that I've trained in over the years. Um, some of the stuff that I do is very fast moving and intense. It just sort of depends on what the person best responds to. Um, but it's the same basic idea that it's all interconnected. So you can grab the levers that are really measured. The reason I wanted to work with the body is because I wanted to know that I was getting better. And I didn't have a way to know that, like, well, did I resolve that belief? I don't know. Until I could match it in my body somewhere and check, did my body react to it? So it's the skeptic in me that was like, oh, let me find a way to measure this. And that's where I ended up with the body. And it was just by happenstance that starting and ending in the body happens to also be, generally speaking, the way that the body, that your life experience grows, that the body reacts to the environment. The brain then becomes aware of it and, and forms a full 3D experience out of it. And then the body experiences what the brain thinks. So if I start back at the instinct, then the whole experience changes. In your professional opinion, Bob Gardner, what is the connection between trauma and addiction? So I know that there's a lot of talk out there, like Gabor Mate is really big on talking about trauma and addiction. And First off, I what I do is challenge just about everything I've been handed, right? Just like addiction isn't a real thing, trauma isn't a real thing either. Either it's a label that we're placing on certain experiences in order to talk about them. Um, but he'll kind of like, and many people try to point back to some childhood trauma or some life event or some something that begins this compulsive cycle. Now, for me, the people I started working with, a, a solid forty percent of them or so never had what anyone would call a traumatic childhood. Now, I know a lot of people would read it and be like, wow, we could find it somewhere. But that's like looking for confirmation bias. They had wonderful parents who loved them. They were they had wonderful opportunities. They were not poor. They might not have been the richest people on the planet. And just somehow they ended up in some compulsive cycle, especially when it comes to sexual stuff. There's any number of things that can happen. We could, we could call society traumatic, but calling it traumatic doesn't really help us resolve the issue. And so for me, compulsive behavior comes down to one thing only. A person is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. they, they don't feel great in that moment in their body. And they are looking for anything that can help them feel better. Mm -hmm. And the thing that they're going to go to is the last thing that worked really well. So if it is something as intense as heroin or meth or, or pornography and sexual encounters or, or things like that, and that's the thing that's worked, then they'll go to that. But it could be yelling at people on the highway, you know, and road rage. It could be 
um, going into their room and turning on loud music and just, uh, you know, drowning out the world. It could be compulsive, like eating the whole bag of chips, but only tasting three of them. You know, it could be any number of behaviors and all of them boil down not to trauma, but to the simple observable fact that somewhere the body that you're in is uncomfortable. This becomes massively helpful because you no longer have to go hunting through the past to find something to fix. It's here and now, this moment that is leading you to that behavior because there are moments that you don't go to that behavior. So are you truly an addict if you if there are moments that you can stop? So that's the question that I had at the beginning. And th this approach has been exceptionally helpful because it eliminates the need to talk about it forever. Or to, and sometimes it is helpful to assess beliefs and thoughts. But generally speaking, what we're looking at is the person's body is uncomfortable. Could be because of health issues. Could be because there was something that scared them. Could be because, you know, um, something that they would call a trigger keeps happening. Could be any number of reasons why. But if the body wasn't uncomfortable, they wouldn't be going to that behavior. Great explanation. Now, how can we train our body to remove stress and anxiety with movement and breath? So um, stress and anxiety themselves are discomfort, some form of discomfort that we label in all kinds of different ways. Everybody experiences anxiety and stress differently. Um, and so instead of thinking of them as a thing, look back at your body and you go, all right, my body is in this state. Where am I tense? Check everywhere. Your fingernails are not stressed out, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> your nose hairs are not in the process of freaking out about tomorrow's homework or the deadline that's happening. And so look for the areas that are not involved and then go back in and be like, okay, cool. What is there? How am I tense? Where am I stuck? How am I breathing? How am I moving? And then just start to toggle those. So in any given moment, this is a process I call emotional ninjutsu because I loved the Ninja Turtles as a kid. <laughs> um, and so in any given moment, check what is happening and where in my body and then begin to breathe differently. It doesn't have to be, oh, take slow breaths. It can be any kind of different breathing because every type of breathing changes the experience. So breathe differently, start to loosen up and relax the body, start to move differently, and then start to get yourself into a position that feels wonderful. Here's an example. My website broke a number of years ago. And so my brain starts running through the scenarios of how I'm never going to put food on the table again. My kids are going to go to school in rags. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to lose the home, everything. In that moment, I'm frantically standing there on the computer, moving jittery, really jerky movements, trying to figure things out. This is not helping my internal state at all, but you know, money has to be made, right? So there I am agitating myself. And my wife walks in the door and says, Bob, do you wanna, my brother wants to know if you wanna go fishing with him and the boys this weekend. Uh, he just needs to know in order to be able to make plans. And my brain about explodes. I did not say this outside, out loud, but on the inside, I was like, are you kidding me, woman? I am in the middle of trying to save our family from death, doom, and destruction. Everything is going down to hell in a handbasket. We've got to fix this. And you want me to figure out if I'm going fishing? <laughs> now, times past, I probably would have just said, sure, fine, and then moved on. And I hope I'm gone to the very next uh, activity and then seethed about it for weeks on end about how I never get free time and I don't get time to myself and I'm always doing stuff. But instead, because of what I'd learned, I dropped right then and there on the floor of my closet. I did snow angels on the carpet and I breathed in a weird way. And I'm like, hoo, hoo, hoo. my wife looks at me. She's like, are you okay? Do you need me to like punch you in the chest or something? <laughs> No, no, I'm good. I'm just, you know, the website broke and I'm freaking out inside my head. And I'm, I'm really having a hard time. I got to figure this out. Can you just wait a couple hours for me to give you a, re a response? And she goes, yeah, sure. Leaves the room. I feel wonderful because I changed how I was standing. I changed how I was breathing. I changed my movement. I even narrated out loud what was going on to pull myself out of being stuck inside of the thoughts. And all of those things together... I felt great. I got up and then I started looking at the website again. Doesn't mean I didn't get a little frustrated, but nothing near what was happening because in that moment I changed things. 
is a snow angel on the floor the best thing to do in the supermarket? I mean, maybe not, but probably not in a board meeting, but there are simple ways that you can do it. You can shrug your shoulders. You can just kind of lean to one side. You can stretch. Nobody has any problem with you stretching or yawning. These are simple things you can do. You can take a couple of deep breaths. You can take a walk outside. These are all ways of changing how you breathe, how you move, and how you're standing so that your body tension can release, the discomfort can ebb, and then you actually have all your faculties available to solve your life problems instead of the little bit that are available because the rest are being used to make yourself miserable. Beautiful. And again, that is very much like the work of Moshe Feldenkrais, changing your posture, changing your breathing, changing the way that you're moving, and, the, and even just doing those things, working with your breath and your movement, can begin to change the way you think, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And people could try it right now if they're listening. Just go upside down on your chair. Tell me how your thoughts go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, with that, let's take another break and listen to a message from one of our commercial sponsors here at UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. And we're listening to Bob Gardner talking about Freeing yourself from the addictive process. So Bob Gardner, you call yourself the freedom specialist. And we talked earlier about what freedom means to you. And freedom means is a, a lot to a lot of people. <laughs> I, I remember in 2015, my mother and I visited Cuba. And it's like, okay, if you don't like the United States, just go to Cuba <laughs> or any communist country. <laughs> And, and you will change your mind about a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and even I know when I did a lot of inner work about money, what I realized is that in previous lifetimes, I had been an indentured servant. So I was always working to get my freedom rather than just realizing I'm already free. <laughs> How is freedom accessible to everyone? How can you empower people to experience more freedom in their life? So I would first, ultimately, freedom for me is a state of being. And that state of being depends on nothing on the outside of you, for the most part. Obviously, if you're in the city dump, the smells are going to affect some things. You know, if you're in a, a situation where someone's firing a gun at you, that's going to affect some of your outside situations. But most of it still is on the inside. If you imagine a newborn infant in the middle of those situations who's not being like a, at the moment abused or beaten or anything like that, it's just sitting there wide eyed, sort of soaking in the environment without any clue about all of the future plans or utopian societies or money issues or anything else like that. It is free because it hasn't programmed itself to do anything other than really enjoy the life that's around it yet we haven't taught it yet how to be miserable so ultimately it's a state of being but to get to that state of being i had to kind of take the approach that freedom is a skill and not a pill mm. when i learned to walk for instance and when i've watched my kids all of them get up and learn to walk it's just a fascinating thing they're doing it one playfully if they're not interested, they don't do it. They don't bother with it. If they are interested, it's because there are people around them cheering them on and they're like trying to go them into it or they see their brothers or sisters doing it or they want to get something from a, a little bit higher up and they can't reach it the way that they're at. Crawling has been an efficient way of living and most people live in a crawling state, I would say, when it comes to their emotional and mental well-being. It's great. You can get around. Everyone here listening has a 100% success rate at surviving everything life has thrown at them. If you are listening to this at all and you're alive, then, then you've survived it all. You are amazing. That's what crawling can do. You can get around. Of course, sure, you might get holes in your jeans. You, it might be a little bit slower than some of the other people, but you do it. 
So why learn to walk? Well, at first, the baby doesn't see the point. They get up, they take a couple steps. It's a pain in the rear to try and figure out how to balance. They fall on their can, then they crawl to the toy. And then, man, well, that was kind of fun. They get up again, they stand up, they sit down. They hear people cheering for it. And so they do it again for praise. And eventually they kind of pick it up. There's a day where they just kind of get the knack. At that point, it's a skill, but it's no longer a skill they have to think about and worry about and consider. There's not any adult I know of that trips on the sidewalk, stays there and goes, I'll never walk again. <laughs> but that's the way we talk to people who are struggling with addiction, that if you've relapsed, you're back at the beginning. You're not back at the beginning. You've learned everything you've learned up till now. You just tripped over something. So look at what you tripped over, learn from it, get up, keep walking, have an amazing life. So if I, if I look at freedom as a skill instead of a pill that you take or something that you're waiting from the outside for someone to save you, then it's clear then that the best way to do skills, to, to form a new synapse, what they found in some laboratories is that it takes about 200 to 400 repetitions to get a new synapse to kind of stabilize itself, a new synaptic connection. But when done in a state of play, they've seen it happen in 10 to 20 repetitions. Mm. That's how powerful doing things as like a game is. Mm. So life is already happening. You might as well enjoy it. You're going to go learn a new skill of freedom. Freedom is enjoyment anyway. So it's a double play on that one. So you get up and you start to practice simple things that put your body into this state of feeling wonderful. It doesn't always have to feel excited. It doesn't always have to feel like... I'm on top of the world. Everything's amazing. That sounds a little manic. It's just this state of ease that's in that like from deep from the well of your being. And that can happen by simple breathing practice. So what I do with the people that I start to work with, the first thing I have them do before we ever address their beliefs or thoughts or anything like that. Here's what you're going to do in the morning to wake up. Here's what you're going to do in the evening before you go to bed. Simple practices that help them sleep a little better and wake up feeling a little bit better. If that's the state the body's in, then it's a lot easier to address all the thoughts and all the feelings and all the other things that are going on through the day. So the first thing we're training them to do is put your body at ease. And if you've ever seen somebody who's truly blissful, I've never heard anybody be like, man, I feel so good. I think I'm going to go take a hit of heroin now. Like I've never heard anybody do that. When they feel wonderful, they just want to stay there. And that's the key. That's the skill. So every time you're feeling not that way, take a step back and be like, hmm, okay, what's happening? Where? How can I breathe different? How can I move different? How can I stand a little bit differently? And step by step, this becomes a muscle memory to the point where one day, uh, it was a number of months ago, I, I went through a panic attack. Uh, it was like six months ago or something. I had worked out, I hadn't eaten. I had worked out a little bit harder than I should have. And my body started to go into this hyperventilated state. And in the middle of that, an emergency happened at work where we needed to get something taken care of for, so I was trying to think at the same time as like recover from being really dumb about, about how I was working out. And all of a sudden this sort of like sense of impending doom hit and everything associated with panic attacks. And I'm sitting there and after about 30 seconds in, not knowing what to do. I'm like trying to write and my handwriting's going every which way. All of a sudden, my body on its own stopped, did some of the breathing practices that I had trained for so many years, then like held its breath on empty and then did them again and then held it. And I was sitting in the middle of it like, wow, I'm literally watching my body take care of me. This is amazing. <laughs> and then I got up and I went over to the piano and sang because that Guys, by the way, if you want to elongate your breathing and it's hard to control your breathing, just start singing. You have to breathe out longer. It'll work. And it's great for anxiety. Just start singing. So I did that. And so total time elapsed was like five minutes. And I was, I felt wonderful. And that was because my body had learned a skill and then it just did it on autopilot. Great observations. And I love everything you just said. I will add to it. This one of the ways I think that we can all find freedom is to recognize our choices, whether it's I can choose to breathe differently, I can choose to hold my posture differently, I can choose to move differently. So I can choose to think differently, right? And when we realize on the mental level, oh, I actually have all these choices, I'm not actually trapped 
right? Then we can get out of that depressed and anxious state. The second thing that I love about your description of you having a panic attack um, was how you followed the energy. So years ago, I studied, studied with a Qigong teacher named Pragata, who I believe is based in Portugal. And one of the things that he did, he would do his Qigong movements. And then in between his prescribed movements, he would pause, pay attention to the energy in his own body, and then move in the way that our ener his energy directed. So he followed, he tuned into his inner energy and followed the energy and allowed the body to make the movement. So I, I really love the way that you're describing how we can change our inner state for the better. And yeah. no, no drugs. <laughs> oh, the, the only reason that drugs work anyway is because your body already makes those chemicals on the inside. So if you're going to control your body with a chemical, it's, are you going to do it from the outside or the inside is the only question you're really asking. Um, what you described about Qigong, like when I, I've been doing Tai Chi and Qigong and, and training and those things since 1996, um, uh, you know, teaching and all that other stuff, the most important piece of the practice. A lot of people think, oh, if I learn this secret movement, then that will do the trick. It's not. It's what you're describing. The most important piece of the practice is, OK, cool. You've turned on whatever the, the generator is in the body. Now you got to let it do its work. And sometimes that moment, so you've done a few things and then you you feel this one, like let's say you're doing a head twisting one. And then after you're done, all of a sudden you just feel this movement, want to unwind your neck a certain way and then you want to bend over. Sometimes that can take two, three, four, five times as long as the initial movement because all you did was like, hey body, I'm going to give you a chance to kind of work things out. And this beautiful, massive intelligence inside you can take this extra energy you've created and actually do things that you would never imagine. You couldn't think about. You would not. You'd be like, no, if we're going to fix the neck, let's just fix the neck. All of a sudden, your legs start shaking and then your neck feels better. How does that work? Because your body is that intelligent. There's so much wisdom inside of this system. And people don't take the time to digest the food they've eaten, so to speak. The movements that you've done, the practices you've done. Do you give yourself space afterwards to allow those to actually soak in or are you running to the next practice? And it's possible that the part of the reason people don't get as much out of them is because they don't allow the digestion process to happen. Wonderful observation. So Bob Gardner, how can we train ourselves to find happiness and to be happy just automatically without making a lot of effort? So that is, that's what boils down to instinct, right? Um, first off, you got to know what happiness feels like for you. <laughs> I remember at one point in time, I was in a counselor's office and I was like, well, what is happiness to you? And he's like, I can't describe that. It's like trying to describe the taste of an orange. And I was like, this doesn't help me at all. <laughs> Here's what happiness feels like to me. And I described this effervescent kind of expansion inside my body, almost like a soda pop that just is on the inside, all the bubbles coming up. It's this lightness that despite what's happening on the outside, there's this sense of ease. Like I'm wearing loose clothing and, and my circumstances are the clothing, but I'm free inside of them. And it, it, it kind of boils down to this sense of open-mindedness and a perception and no reactivity or anything else like that. And I started describing this in terms of physical feelings. And he's like, you're so hung up on the body. Why would you? <laughs> Have you ever considered that you're wrong? I'm like, yeah, all the time. That's why I'm here talking to you. <laughs> and and, uh, and but, but he's like, why are you so hung up on the body? I was like, because, you know, it's the only thing that makes qualifies me to be alive on the planet right now. I figure I might as well pay attention to it. So first, you got to know what happiness feels like for you. And it's probably you're going to describe it in different terms than I will. And often, if you listen to the way people describe their happiness, well, at least for me, that didn't help because then I made up like anime, like, you know, fantasies about what happiness really was. And I started chasing that down instead of realizing, oh, wait, I already feel that. I just, I guess I would describe it this way. So first note what it feels like. Think about the, the most joyous times in your life. What did it feel like? What did it feel like in your body? Forget about what was happening where was that coming from? What, what, what was happening? And can you reproduce that? Now that you know what it is, now here's a simple thing that you can do. Make a list of all the things 
that help you get to that place. Mm-hmm. You know, I challenge my clients to have at least 50 things mm-hmm. because then when they're stuck, because you, when you're stuck, you don't, you can't think. So, so put the list on your phone and then like run through the menu and see what you can do to change your state with that. That, that would be a simple thing uh, to do. Basically, practice going into that state as often as possible. And your body will get the message, oh, we actually want to stay here. Okay. And it'll move from the from being a black belt at misery to being a white belt at happiness at first. And then you go in and now you're a yellow belt. Now you're a blue belt. And eventually you're a black belt at happiness. You, you've lived in the dojo of delight long enough that it's second nature. Someone swings and you respond with a laugh instead of with, you know, a fist. <laughs> I love that. Now, here at the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio, one of the things that we talk about is that all illness, all disease is slowed down vibration. And we've all felt that. Just think about the way you feel when you have a cold. You sit on the couch, you can hardly get up and make chicken soup. It's slowed down vibration, right? And all healing happens when you raise the vibration. And if you think about happiness, One of the ways I would describe happiness, it's a high vibration state, right? Sure, yeah. And so I love the idea of making lists, like what will help me get to happiness? What will raise my vibration? And as as we pay attention to what's empowering me to raise my vibration, then you're going to experience happiness. You're gonna experience your wholeness. And you're going to look at life totally different. So Bob Gardner, final question. What is the root cause of all trauma, regardless if it came from childhood or adulthood? So that I would say, if you really boil boil it down, it's just that the body is stuck in a place that's uncomfortable. Um, That isn't the root event, obviously. That's not what happened. But experience of trauma is built on your brain is not in touch with the outside world. It's the security guard in the little shack with all the little cameras trying to make sense of what's happening on the outside. And when it sees certain things, it's like boop, boop, boop. And it's like trauma, trauma, trauma. And it has a trauma response. And then the thoughts run and then the emotions run and all the stuff that happens out in the field and everything else in the body, the tensions happen but it's not going to have that response if nothing triggers the alarm and the alarm that's being triggered is what I call in the book angustia, right? To give a new name that doesn't have all the baggage to it. It is a tension, a squeezing, a tightness in certain areas that changes chemistry that affects organ function, all of these other things. When that releases, no trauma response, no trauma response at all. And I think part of what drugs do for some people is it forces the body to not be able to function the way that it was functioning. And so all of a sudden they let go of their habitual memorized habit of holding themselves in such a way that the brain keeps producing this trauma and this fear and this paranoia. So when you're dealing with the root, the root really is how, what is the state of your body? And if you can change that, you can change the past and the future. Great explanation. So Bob Gardner, any final thoughts for our audience that you would like to share? Yeah, what's driven this for me in my entire life is this basic notion. I don't have scientific proof for this, but everything I read seems to confirm it so far. And that is that the human body is the most advanced technology on the planet. Everything about who we are and what we do is far superior to just about anything else happening. And right now we're giving that ability away, pouring it into machines and devices, making them smarter. They're now making decisions. Will they one day become capable of becoming conscious and self-aware? I don't know. But the more we give all of our life away to everything on the outside, we miss what's possible on the inside. Right now, everybody listening has everything it takes to eradicate all mental illness, all disease, all pain, all suffering. Right now, you have what it takes. The question is, Have you been given the ability to use it? Have you been taught? And have you given yourself permission to ditch the narrative of suffering and graduate into a life of freedom? Powerful message. You've been listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. 
I'm your host, Katherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Our guest today, Bob Gartner, is the founder of The Freedom Specialist and the author of Built for Freedom and host of the Alive and Free podcast. You can find out more about Bob Gartner and his wonderful work at his website, thefreedomspecialist.com. And remember, you can free yourself from trauma and addictions naturally by changing your posture, changing your movement, and changing your breathing. And just doing those things, three things will change the way you look at the world. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.